Hi, I'm Sabra Klein. I'm a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where I am also co-director of the Center for Women's Health, Sex, and Gender Research. Today, I will be presenting a, a discussion to you entitled Sex Matters for Respiratory Viral Pathogenesis and Responses to Vaccines. I thought we could begin with ensuring we all have an understanding of what it means to say that sex is a biological variable. So as a biological variable, this is referring to the biological differences between males and females based on sex chromosome complement, reproductive tissues, and the hormones that are secreted. In females, in particular female mammals, there are two X chromosomes. In male mammals, there is an X and a Y chromosome. On the Y chromosome is a gene, abbreviated SRY, which encodes for testis determining factor. In the presence of this hormonal factor and others, the bipotential gonad develops into a testis that primarily post puberty will begin secreting high concentrations of androgens, including testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. In the absence of a Y chromosome, the SRY gene and testis determining factor, the bipotential gonad develops into an ovary that postpubertally will secrete high concentrations of estrogens and progesterone. Now I'm treating this as though sex is binary. And we know that disorders of sexual development do in fact occur and that sex can occur along a continuum. Unfortunately, to date, we understand very little about the immunological consequences of intersex or other disorders of sexual development. So for our discussion today, I'm going to stick to this binary treatment of sex. But please know that myself and others are very interested in exploring the diverse range of, of sexes. Now, these hormones can only have their biological effects by binding to specific re receptors that are located in the intracellular space of, of cells that possess these receptors. And it turns out that many immune cells, including macrophages, dendritic cells, neutrophils, natural killer cells, and lymphocytes like T cells and B cells, all contain receptors for sex steroid hormones. Generally speaking, in the presence of estrogens and progesterone and hence activation of their respective receptors, we see an increase in immune-related activity. In the presence of high concentrations of androgens or great activity of the androgen receptors, we typically see a decrease in immune-related responses. As a result, when it comes to viral diseases, including respiratory viral diseases, in the presence of estrogen and progesterone, as well as two X chromosomes defining females, we tend to find that females clear virus quite readily. But the downside of this greater activity of immune cells is that there is a greater risk of immune-related pathologies. In males, again, as defined as having an X and a Y chromosome, as well as high concentrations of androgens binding to androgen receptors on immune cells, this can in turn contribute to a male bias in reduced vaccine um, efficacy or reduced vaccine-induced immunity, as well as persistence of viral infections. When it comes to viral infectious diseases, including those that occur outside of our respiratory tract, sex differences have been observed. I'm showing you these differences in the context of a host damage response. So to orient you to this graph, we have host damage ranging from a low degree of damage to a high degree of damage on our y-axis, and immune responses ranging from weak to strong. The disease response curve is located in black, and we can have a high degree of disease in the event that we have a weak immune response, which can contribute to high degree of host tissue damage, 
possibly due to virus replication. And if we follow this curve all the way around, we see that we can also have a high degree of disease or tissue host tissue damage in the event that an immune response is too strong. What I've listed here are some of the viruses for which we know that either increased virus replication or host-mediated immunopathology contribute to disease outcomes. The stippled line that I've drawn in the middle just separates this out and, and provides us with a testable hypothesis. For viral infections in which tissue damage is being caused by an inability to control virus replication, I predict there will be a male bias in those diseases. And today I will use SARS-CoV-2 as our example. In contrast, for viral diseases in which immune-mediated pathology contributes to a worse disease outcome, I would hypothesize that we would see a female bias in disease outcomes. And I will use influenza viruses as my example. Well, let's begin with influenza viruses. I've worked with, with these viruses for well over a decade, and just recently I had a wonderful opportunity to work with a group of investigators at the National Institutes of Health where they were conducting human H1N1 influenza virus challenges. And utilizing several of their, their trials, we looked to see if we could see sex differences in outcomes from influenza virus challenge of what I would refer to as young adult people. So as you can see, we had 164 participants in this study. People were challenged with influenza, again, an H1N1 strain of influenza, and were followed for up to eight weeks post-challenge. Several outcome measures were measured, and they were measured separately for males and females, and the differences were compared. Bolded are those outcomes for which significant sex differences were observed. It turned out that while males and females did not show differences in the hemagglutination inhibition antibody titers, so that's inhibition of the viral protein, abbreviated HA, which is very important for virus entry. Sex differences, again, were not observed. But when we looked at NA, or neuraminidase inhibition, and neuraminidase is another viral antigen that's very important for release or the exit of virus from infected cells. We found that males actually had greater in NA inhibitory immune responses as compared with their female counterparts both four and eight weeks after challenge. Females had um, a greater presence of symptoms so they were presenting um, with symptoms for a longer duration of time and had a greater number of total symptoms reported. Females appeared to have greater disease, and one hypothesis that we have is that the greater antibody response against NA in males may be contributing to better outcomes, a hypothesis that we still need to test. One of the ways that we can test hypotheses that are generated from human studies is to use animal models, which allow us to get a bit more invasive and, and to really explore mechanisms mediating sex differences. So using adult C57 black six mice that we can infect with diverse influenza viruses, in this case, much like the previous slide, we've worked with H1N1 influenza viruses. And when we infect male and female uh, mice with influenza A viruses, what we typically find is that females, stereotypically pink, tend to get sicker than males. We can't ask our mice what symptoms they possess, so one of the ways in which we can just determine sickness is by measuring their body mass. Because much like humans, when mice get sick, they tend to huddle in a corner and not eat as much, and they do lose weight. 
as you can see, females lose more weight than males, and it takes them longer to recover than it does males. When we look at viral titers in the lungs at several time points after infection, what we consistently have found is that among naive animals for whom this is their first and only infection, we typically don't see sex differences in the ability to control virus replication. But by 14 days post-infection, so after virus has been cleared, if we look back at our body mass graph, you can see that females have still not recovered in terms, of the, in terms of their body mass. And if you look at the graph to the far right, where it's labeled on the y-axis, DFCO, that's diffusion capacity or exchange of CO2 and O2 across the lungs, the stipple baseline pulmonary function for males and females for which there is no sex difference. And what we find is out 14 days after inoculation, males have returned back to baseline pulmonary function, whereas females are still below the normal range for pulmonary function. So even in the absence of virus, females still have not returned to, to complete respiratory health. On the bottom left, if we look at inflammation histologically, and, and we quantify this by a scoring system, we find that females, 14 days after inoculation, again, long after virus has been cleared, have more inflammation noted in their lungs. If we measure cytokines in the pulmonary tissue, including TNF-alpha and CCL2, both of which are inflammatory mediators of disease following influenza virus infection. And we look at this within the first week after inoculation with an H1N1 influenza virus. We find that females have greater induction of these as well as other pro-inflammatory mediators as compared with males. So it is not that males are not engaging in an immune response, they are, but when we see an almost 100-fold increase in the presence of certain proteins in the lungs, this suggests to us that this response may be excessive and contributing to tissue damage and worse outcomes in females. To highlight the important immunosuppressive or immunoregulatory activities of androgens in the context of inflammation and influenza virus infection, we have looked at the effects that androgens play and specifically androgen receptor signaling in dampening influenza, in, excuse me, in dampening inflammation during influenza virus infection. So again, using C57 black six, in this case male mice, who are adults, so typically eight to 10 weeks at the time of infection. And again, measuring body mass as a general indicator of clinical disease. What we find among males is that gonadally intact males, so males who have their testes, do not lose as much body mass as males who've had their testes removed. The removal of the testes is referred to as gonadectomy, and that's abbreviated GDX on these slides. Gonadectomized males get much sicker than gonadally intact males. On the far left graph, if we replace testosterone in these males who've been gonadectomized, we find that they respond in a similar way to H1N1 influenza virus infection in which they experience a less severe outcome. In the middle graphic, in the middle top graphic, if we not only treat gonadectomized males with testosterone, but we co-administer a drug called flutamide, which is an androgen receptor antagonist, this significantly reduces um, body mass and, in other words, makes H1N1 influenza infection disease severity worse. So if we block androgen receptors, we block the protective effects of testosterone. 
Well, one thing I haven't told you yet is that our sex steroids, being steroids, they all derive from cholesterol. And estradiol actually is derived from testosterone through um, the, an enzymatic conversion um, by a, a, an enzyme called aromatase. We can also work with what we refer to as a non-aromatizable androgen, so an androgen that cannot be converted to estradiol to then subsequently bind to an estrogen receptor. And it's abbreviated in the far right graphic, DHT, and that stands for dihydrotestosterone. And so what we did is we gonadectomized males, we replaced testosterone in some animals, dihydrotestosterone in other animals, and then still other gonadectomized animals received a placebo. Whether we treated animals with dihydrotestosterone or testosterone, we saw an improved outcome. This was not due to differences in virus replication, but instead, as seen in the lower panels, was due to a dampening of both inflammatory monocytes as well as virus-specific T cells, particularly after virus had been cleared from the lungs. Well, this greater immunity in females, while is detrimental in terms of inflammation and inflammation-mediated disease, when females recover from influenza virus infection, what we find is that the adaptive immune responses are typically greater for females as compared with males. So when we measure things like serum IgG or we measure IgA specific to our H1N1 virus and bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, so in the respiratory tract, we find that females now, the open bars, have greater adaptive immune responses than their male counterparts. We also find that in the lungs, females have more antibody secreting cells, so cells secreting, in this case, IgA, as well as a greater number or frequency of CD4 positive T cells, as well as CD8 positive T cells, both memory cells as well as resident memory cells, which is quite exciting when we think about what that might do in response to a secondary challenge. So this got us thinking about vaccines. And if females who recover from infection have greater adaptive immune responses, maybe females who are vaccinated would also mount greater adaptive immune responses. To test this, we use a prime boost strategy for vaccination with a monovalent H1N1 vaccine in male and female mice. We then wait 28 or 35 days after the, the primary vaccination and find that females do, in fact, have greater titers of IgG as well as neutralizing antibody, which is shown in the middle panel. Not only is the quantity of antibody greater for females than males, but the quality of that antibody is greater. Females have greater avidity in, of their antibody as compared with males. Not only do females have greater avidity, but another marker of quality is class switching. And class switching to IgG2C in C57 black 6 mice is indicative of an antiviral antibody response, of which females have greater titers than males. Well, one of the important mediators of class switching of IgG to IgG2C and away from IgG1 involves an X-linked gene called toll-like receptor 7, a gene we often think of in the context of innate immunity, but that can be equally important in B-cell-mediated or antibody-mediated immunity. If we isolate B-cells, from vaccinated male and female mice and measure relative gene expression, we find that B cells from females have more TLR7 as compared to B cells from males. We do not see a similar sex difference in the closely related TLR8 gene. Again, TLR7 is located on the X chromosome. In many cases, this shouldn't matter because there should be random X inactivation of one copy of each gene on the X chromosome to control for the dosage effect of having two X chromosomes. 
Now, there are many ways in which X-linked genes can escape X inactivation, and roughly 15% of human genes encoded on the X chromosome escape X inactivation, including toll-like receptor 7. In our mice, what we observed was an epigenetic mechanism mediating greater expression of TLR7 in B cells from fem vaccinated females as compared with males in which we showed greater DNA methylation in the promoter of TLR7 following a vaccination in male as compared with females. And so this reduced DNA methylation may be contributing to the greater expression of TLR7 in B cells from females as compared with males. Well, these sex differences in immunity to vaccine contribute to greater protection following virus challenge, something that we're thinking about a lot now in the context of SARS-CoV-2. So in our mice, when we challenge vaccinated males, the closed circles, and females, the open circles, we find that females are better able to control and clear virus from their lungs as compared with their vaccinated male counterparts. And again, we can't ask animals how they're feeling, so we can look at things like changes in body mass with the stippled line indicating the baseline body mass prior to challenge. Females don't change much from baseline. They really don't get sick, whereas vaccinated males are, in fact, getting sick and experiencing some level of disease. We know this is mediated by toll-like receptor 7 because when we knock out toll-like receptor 7, and I will say this is a complete knockout, not specific to B cells, something we still need to do, we eliminate the sex difference in antibody responses, including neutralizing antibody responses as pictured here, as well as the sex difference in the ability to control virus replication within vaccinated animals following challenge. The last point I want to make before moving on to SARS-CoV-2 is that not only are X-linked genes important, but estrogens can be very important, too, by causing elevated immunity in females. We've shown this association in humans, and we can show the cause effect in mice. So if we jump to the bottom panel for the sake of time, what we find is that female who are vaccinated have greater antibody responses as compared with their male counterparts. If we gonadectomize males and females, take away the testes in males, take away the ovaries in females, we eliminate the sex difference. And if we replace testosterone exogenously in gonadectomized males, and if we replace estradiol exogenously in females who've been gonadectomized, we reinstate the sex difference. So we know that these hormones play fundamental roles, possibly in modulating some of the genes in B cells, including X-linked genes like toll-like receptor 7. So greater immunity in females of reproductive ages contribute to both worse outcome from influenza as well as better outcomes from vaccination. I'd now like to change gears and talk briefly about SARS-CoV-2, a virus, a respiratory virus that needs no introduction at this stage. But what may need an introduction is that there are sex differences in the severity of COVID-19. And sex disaggregated data from around the world consistently show that while the number of cases, especially prior to rollout of vaccines, were consistently similar between males and females, Hospital, hospitalization as well as ICU admissions and even death following confirmed cases are consistently greater for males as compared with females. To show you another way of looking at these data, we took these data from various countries during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic and we've rank ordered them here. And what we're looking at are data from 38 countries, blue stereotypically male, pink stereotypically female. And what we find when we look at case fatality rates, they were consistently greater for males as compared with females. For 10 countries, these data were not just broken down between male and female, but they were also broken down by age ranges. And what we find is that at diverse age ranges, I should say adult age ranges, so among individuals 20 years of age and older within each age group, males are significantly more likely to die than females. 
But I think it is also very important to make the point that among females, very consistent with what we see in males, there is an age-related increase in severity or an age-related increase in the likelihood of dying from SARS-CoV-2. And again, this is among unvaccinated individuals. When we used electronic health records from Johns Hopkins, we found something very similar. When we looked at the proportion of individuals who were tested and looked at those that tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 among those that had been tested, and we did this separately for males and females across diverse age groups, what we found was that among individuals 18 to 49 years of age all the way to 65 to 74 years of age, a greater percentage of males were testing positive. This reversed at both the younger ages as well as the older ages, and others have reported this reversal of the sex difference as well at these age groups. However, when we look among those who tested positive, those that had severe enough disease to be admitted into the hospital, we found that significantly more males were being admitted into Johns Hopkins hospitals among individuals ranging from 18 years of age upward to 64 years of age. In our paper, which is currently in press at Open Forum Infectious Diseases, we report that in all of our modeling, it was inflammatory markers that were the greatest predictor of worse outcomes from SARS-CoV-2 infection and severe COVID-19 disease. Pictured here are two of the inflammatory mediators that we measured, IL-6 and C-reactive protein. And what I want to show you is that in most cases, if a sex difference is reported, it's reported collapsed across all ages, where we do in fact find greater inflammatory responses among males as compared with females within 48 hours of admission. But when we take a closer look, it's really the younger aged individuals that are driving this difference. We really see the most pronounced male bias in these inflammatory mediators among individuals 18 to 64 years of age, with this really equaling out at these later ages. Where we think this could be important is that elevated IL-6 is but one indicator used for determination of receipt of monoclonal antibodies that can block the IL-6 receptor. And while more males do, in fact, uh, qualify for administration of this monoclonal antibody treatment than do females, when we look at proportions, a significantly greater proportion of males who qualified are actually receiving these treatments at Johns Hopkins. So this highlights to us that not only could there be some sex-associated differences, but gender-associated differences as well. Not only do males have greater inflammatory responses early after infection, but once they've convalesced or recovered from COVID-19 infection, we find that males have greater antibody responses um, to SARS-CoV-2 antigens, as well as neutralizing antibodies against the virus than do females. It's consistently been shown that individuals with more severe disease, so those who are hospitalized, tend to have greater antibody responses. Older aged individuals also have greater antibody responses. And we are now showing that male sex is yet another predictor of greater antibody responses. However, more recently, we're starting to observe that the durability of that antibody may not be as good for males as compared with females. We've also done work to develop an animal model to allow us to get a bit more mechanistic in how we explore sex differences in SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis. So using male golden Syrian hamsters, we have observed that consistent with humans, males get sicker than females. So again, we're looking at body mass changes following infection, and here we find that males are actually losing more of their body mass and taking about a week longer to fully recover than their female counterparts. When we look using CT scans at the lungs of these animals, as in panel B, we do find what looks like the development of pneumonia with those ground glass opacities. We can also use unbiased ways um, or, or modeling 
um, in order to identify affected areas of the lung and create these three-dimensional models to then quantify the proportion of affected lung relative to total lung. And when we graph that, as in panel D, we find that males have significantly greater a significantly greater percentage of affected lung as compared with females. So they are experiencing more pulmonary disease than our female hamsters. We can look using histology as well as flow cytometry. We can see greater infiltration of immune cells, particularly inflammatory myeloid cells in the lungs of infected male as compared with female hamsters. And that's what's shown in the bottom, um, in the bottom graph. But interestingly, we do find that females have more lymphocytes than males. While we don't see sex differences in virus replications, whether we measure virus titers or viral RNA copies in the lungs, much like with the greater numbers of lymphocytes seen in the lungs of female as compared with male hamsters, we find that antibody responses, both in the blood, so when we look at IgG uh, to total SARS-CoV-2 inactivated virus, or in the right, if we look at, at, at at um, recognition of the spike receptor binding domain, again, in the wild type, as well as in several variant viruses, females, the open symbols, have greater antibody responses than their male counterparts in the closed symbols. If we look locally in the lungs for IgA, we find that IgA recognizing the spike receptor binding domain is greater for females as compared with males. And we're seeing that the kinetics of this antibody is remaining higher for females out as late as 28 days post-infection. So whether we use epidemiological country-level data, electronic health records, clinical patient samples, or animal models, biological sex affects responses and outcomes from SARS-CoV-2 infection. I'm grateful for all of the members of my lab and my wonderful collaborators at Johns Hopkins, as well as the funding um, that we've received for this research. Thank you.